stimulating and provoking, uh, provocative as his talk was, uh, it only gives the merest hint of the riches to be found in his book. Um, so don't think that, well, now I've heard his talk, I don't need to read the book. You don't have the slightest idea of what's in the book. There's so much uh, more depth and insight there. And even, even, the, even the book, uh, Cronman's own mind greatly surpasses even his book, and it's talking to him at length before this event um, <coughs> about his, his thoughts on education more broadly, I realized that he'd already anticipated most of what I'm about to say now, so uh, even the book doesn't capture the full <laughs> richness of his thought. But nonetheless, uh, I've responded to the book, and uh, I'll say just a few things about it as a way to uh, provoke our discussion about it. We'll leave plenty of time for a discussion about it. Um, and then I'll also say a few things about his book in relationship to uh, the Daniel Webster program, to the initiative that we're trying to launch here, and how it might help to serve to um, uh, increase the structure and, and, and focus of liberal arts experience at Dartmouth. Um, now, the two basic parts to Cronman's curricular arguments, or I should say his educational arguments, uh, or to any educational proposal, right? There's, there's a curriculum, he's defending uh, a set of, of classic works, and there's a pedagogy and his pedagogy is focused on the principles of a, of a secular humanism that he referred to but didn't develop. Again, in the book, there's a rich development of these, these ideas. Now, Croman's stance with respect both to his curricular uh, proposals and his pedagogy uh, is, I think, very courageous, uh, maybe a bit lonely uh, and quixotic, but very, very courageous. Um, at a time when the humanities are, are losing their once dominant role within our colleges, Humanities majors nationwide continue to lose enrollments. Uh, humanities departments are losing faculty positions and funding. Um, and perhaps more importantly, uh, the research and teaching in the humanities is losing the respect of social and natural scientists. Cronman shows remarkable courage, I think, in trying to stand against this tide. Not only does he aim to defend the centrality of the humanities within the liberal arts against its detractors outside of the humanities, he also defends the traditional classics of the humanities against the detractors from within the humanities itself. Um, so he's, you might say, fighting a two-front lonely battle here, one against uh, people outside the humanities who have, might have contempt for the humanities, and then many people within the humanities uh, are opposed to his vision of the humanities. Um, and similarly, in another way, uh, at a time when we see a rising tide of religious fundamentalism uh, around the world, and not just abroad, but students at Yale and Dartmouth are increasingly assertive in expressing their religious identities and practices both in and outside of the classroom. Cronman articulates a passionate and philosophically deep argument for the principles of a secular humanism. Of course, many scholars today, especially many scientists, might well call themselves secular humanists. But by Cronman's standards, they're mere secularists. That is, they do reject religious interpretations of the meaning of human life but they don't accept the plural but limited range of meanings to be found in the classic works of the humanities that, that Cronman is defending. So he's a special kind of secular humanist. Cronman's secular humanism, you might say, is a kind of heroic individualism in which each person is focused on the horizon, focused on the horizon of his own death, and struggles to affirm and embody an exemplary human life against that horizon. Uh, in, the, in the words of the famous country song, uh, you've got to walk that lonely valley by yourself. Ain't nobody can walk it for you. <laughs> and this is Cronman's vision, this heroic individualism. You, you can only do it for yourself. Now the challenge here uh, for this position in terms of uh, winning success uh, with it is that, um, as I said, most secularists reject his view of a humanities-based existential humanism while many existential humanists are not secularists, and Cronman himself is very influenced by people like Gabriel Marcel, there's uh, there existential humanists who aren't secularists. Um, so his, he's defending a, a particular conception of secular humanism. Um, but in some ways his position looks, looks very lonely and I'll try to reflect in ways in which maybe he can find more company. Um, and I share Cronman's passion for the great books of the traditional humanities and I find his existential humanism to be both profound and moving, and again, you'd have to read the book to see how he develops it. In my view, though, Cronman book, Cronman's book is torn between two deep purposes. The first is to offer an intensely personal account of his own deepest philosophical and educational commitments. And I think the eloquence and power of his writing and, and speaking stems from the, the wellsprings of his own passion and honesty about this. 
Uh, his second purpose is to argue that, that these principles, these intensely personal principles, uh, should also serve as the basis for a movement uh, to renew the moral, the, the moral basis of the humanities and liberal arts education more generally. Now, I think Cronman's philosophical and educational principles are perfectly well suited, of course, to his own uh, vocation as a teacher and scholar. Um, but as the basis for a broader movement for renewal in higher education, I think his curriculum and his principles of secular humanism may be too narrow. Um, the future of the liberal arts, I believe, depends upon a wider conception of the great books and a wider conception of humanism. Cronman's focused on the humanities and on secular humanism, I, th I think may unnecessarily alienate many potential allies for his important goals. Now, of course, no one can fault Cronman for championing his own personal conception of what curriculum is ideal or what philosophical principles ought to animate the teaching of that curriculum. But I think we also need to, in addition, uh, work to seek principles that can provide more common ground, uh, a more of an overlapping consensus, you might say, as we move forward with the reform in higher education. Now, Cronman's list of great books, again, in the, in the book itself uh, and his examples, are, are very much focused on the traditional humanities. Uh, these books, he says, are uniquely oriented to guide students in a disciplined reflection upon the ultimate meaning of their lives. Uh, but even if we accept uh, his view that the liberal arts education ought to be uh, fundamentally oriented towards seeking the meaning of our own lives, um, I think we need much more than the classic works of the humanities in order to achieve that kind of disciplined reflection. Um, the great works of economics, for example, well known to Professor Croman, of course, from Adam Smith to, to Marx to Max Weber, are focused intensely like a laser on the question of the meaning of human life. Right? Is a life of studious leisure better than a life of productive labor? Does the modern division of labor and specialization make society wealthier but leave individuals poorer? Does academic specialization, a theme in Max Weber, of course, does academic specialization make each scholar more trivial while it makes society more knowledgeable? Does capitalism afford radical new vistas for human freedom, or does it also trap us in an iron cage of competition and environmental destruction, as, as Weber feared? The great works of the social sciences force us to recognize that many features of our lives are not subjects of our own individual choice. Both markets and states liberate us as well as discipline us. Now I mention Max Weber here because although he's not a humanist in the narrow disciplinary sense, uh, he is a humanist in a wider and more important sense in that his work on sociology is resolutely focused on the effects of definite social and economic conditions on the dignity and greatness of man. Weber's famous lament in, in the book on this, this spirit of capitalism about the emerging culture of modern science, he's famously right, specialists without spirit, sensualists without heart, um, that, that very uh, lament could be the subtitle of Cronman's book. I, th I, see, I see the spirit of Weber so powerful. And, and yet this is not, it's, it's a classic work, but not a classic work of humanities. It's a, it's a classic work in the social sciences. But again, I think <coughs> reflecting the, the utter in, indispensable importance of these classic social scientific works in our own reflection on the meaning of life. Um, similarly, I believe that many of the great classics in the natural sciences are indispensable to this kind of disciplined reflection. Right? How can we uh, reflect on the meaning of our own human nature, our own human instincts and impulses? without considering Darwin's theory of evolution. Right? We have to ask ourselves, as Darwin did, is there grandeur that has Darwin thought in the view that all of life has a common origin? Or is it merely humiliating, <laughs> degrading to reflect on how much we share with the, the quote, lower forms of life? Again, classic works in physics, from, of course, from you know, debates between Leibniz and Newton, Einstein and Heisenberg, force us to to confront these issues very directly about the, the meaning of human life, whether it has any uh, relationship to the cosmic drama that we see around us. Uh, are, are we mere aberrations in a larger world of chance and randomness? Or is there a, evidence of some kinds of design and intelligibility in the, in the larger cosmos? All these questions um, very much animate the classic works in the history of physics. So, so I think really to make sense of the drama of human life in its full social and natural setting, we have to, st we have to study not only the, the great books of the humanities, but also the great classics in the social and natural sciences.